Uh, question seven um, is a generator problem. Um, so two students, Shane and Aisha, construct a coil of 25 rectangular loops of side dimensions 10 centimetres. Um, oh, by four centimetres. Um, the coil sits in a magnetic field of 0.2 Tesla and the field lines are horizontal. This is shown in figure seven. Yep. Um, the loops system connects to a transformer of ratio one to 10. The output voltage from the transformer is recorded over time. Coil starting position is shown. It's turned at 2.5 rotations per second in the direction shown. What's the maximum flux that the coil experiences? Okay. Um, so the maximum flux is just going to be when um, the full coil is exposed to the field. So it's going to be when we're at 90 degrees there. And it's just going to be question seven here. So it's just going to be B times A. And in this case, that's 0 0.2 Tesla times, well, the area is uh, 0 0.1 meters times 0 0.04 meters. Um, so that comes out to flux max equals uh, 0 0.2 times 0 0.1. So that's, Eight times ten to the negative one, two, three, four. Uh, ooh, I haven't used a Weber in a while. There you go. Eight times ten to the negative four Weber. Okay, how long does the coil take to achieve its maximum flux from the starting position shown? Okay, so it's it's currently at zero, and then it's going to go ninety degrees to become full. Um, so ninety degrees is one quarter of a cycle. So it's going to be um, so B is going to be T over four. Um, let's call that, uh, we'll call that T, little t max equals uh, big T period over four. And the period is, well, if it's 2.5 rotations per second, then it's the period is 0 0.4 seconds. So it's going to be uh, 0 0.1 seconds. Okay. C. What is the average voltage across the output terminals of the transformer uh, in the time, blah, blah, blah. So it's looking for the average, um, the average voltage or the average EMF of this output. Um, now it's the average voltage across, across the output terminals of the transformer. So it's whatever we get here, we're then gonna multiply it by 10 because we're looking at the output from the transformer. So first off, let's actually just find the the output from the EMF for that quarter cycle. Um, well, we've got a formula for this. Um, it's going to be the, the change in flux over the change in time, but um, we've got a formula that we can write down for this. It's 4NBAF. Um, that just comes from plugging in uh, this for your time and this for your change in flux, but we also, we already know the change in flux. It's from zero to this and it's in this amount of time. So we don't actually have to use this formula, but we could do if we wanted to. Right. So average is going to be, well, we got a, a change of eight times 10 to the negative four Weber in 0 0.1 seconds. So that's eight times 10 to the negative three volts. Now, I just want to check, have we got multiple coils of this? Yeah, we got 25 rectangular loops. So we're going to multiply this by 25. So let's, let's put our N out the front there. So this is going to be N times this. So 25 times eight is 200. So 200 times 10 to the negative three is 0 0.2 volts. Okay. So it looks like we're getting 0 0.2 volts out of this thing. Um, 25 loops, yeah, we've taken that into account. Uh, nice one. Okay. And then um, the last thing is we then put this through the, the so th this is going to be equal to um, the primary side, the voltage on the primary side of the transformer, but we want the voltage on the secondary side on the output. So that's going to be that times 10. So 10 times 0 0.2 volts equals two volts. Okay. So, um, 
so the kind of uh, quite a few steps there we've got change in flux over change of time we've got it happening 25 sort of times inside this loop simultaneously so we multiply by 25 and then we're also taking that voltage and we're stepping it up okay I didn't really like my earlier answer for part uh, 7D, so I'll come back later on today to, to record over the top of that very rambling version. Um, so 7D um, gives you the output of our original circuit, the one that's pictured above, um, and also with this other output. And um, it says, Aisha and Shane are discussing how they would alter the configuration in figure seven, that was the diagram above, so that the original output shown in figure eight appears as the new output shown in figure nine, um, which is a very strange way of putting that, but it's just saying, what would we have to do to get this uh, new output um, in figure nine? Um, explain what alterations we have to make um, to our circuit or to our hardware um, to get a uh, number, uh, to get the new output instead of the old one. Um, so the first thing you want to check whenever you're doing uh, anything like this, is you want to check whether the period is the same. Because if the period's changed, then you know that the the rate that the thing's being physically moved at has changed. Um, and for some reason, these the, the graphs in this are not very well done. So the period here looks to me like a period looks like it's like a little bit more than whatever that line there is. And then one period of this one looks like it looks a little bit longer, like like barely longer. Um, but I've had a look at the solutions and they're saying those two periods are supposed to be the same. So um, hopefully you weren't too thrown out by that. So um, this isn't part of my answer here, but I'm just noting that the periods are the same. So we can't um, just uh, spin the, uh, the coil at a different rate. Um, and then there are two things that jump out at me about the difference between our new output and our old output. One, and hopefully this is the one that um, jumped out at you, is that we have a lower um, voltage coming out. So a lower, um, let's call it an AMF. Um, so we need to alter our circuit in some way um, so that we get that lower AMF. And then the other thing that jumps out at me is that, um, let me just make this a bit more prominent. Um, the other thing that jumps out at me is that while this one, while the, uh, the old one started on a maximum voltage, this one here starts on a zero voltage. So it's out of phase. Um, so um, starting on a zero, voltage. Okay, so how do we change our um, setup to achieve um, any of the, to, to achieve these two changes, which are the, the big two changes between the new output and the original? Well, the lower EMF, that can be achieved in multiple ways. Um, so um, quite a few different options here. You've got um, all the standard stuff that you have from um, generators. So you could use a weaker magnetic field. You could use fewer than 25 turns on uh, the armature. Um, now, if we look at it's, it's, it's half, the amplitude is half here. So we could even, we could, we could be more specific than that. We could say half strength the magnetic field we could say 13 turns instead of 25 we could we could be more specific but i don't think we actually need to because we've got two separate things going on here and each of them you're going to give a suggestion that means that suggests to me that the four marks are suggest the feature that needs to change suggest the change that would do it suggest the feature suggest the change so it's just so it should be pretty simple the mark allocation here um what else could we do we could um Let's have a look at, um, let's have a look at it. Um, we could use a weaker field. We could use fewer of these. We could use a smaller area. So use a smaller area armature. So we could shorten one of the sides. And then the last thing is an option that we don't normally have when we're talking about generators, but we do here is that we could actually change the transformer ratio. So we could um, use a smaller ratio on the step up transformer. 
And let me just check that the wording of the question is that we're measuring this output voltage after the transformer. So original output, the results of the compression circuit compares the original to the new output. Yeah, there's nothing saying that we're measuring it in here. We're measuring on what we're calling the output voltage here. So, um, so we are allowed to change that transformer. And then the other change here is that instead of starting on a maximum, like we do um, with this arrangement, we're starting on a zero, which means we need to be starting with the flux at a maximum because zero voltage means we're at a maximum or a minimum of flux. So um, we rotate our starting position by 90 degrees to start on a maximum slash minimum flux. Um, now you might, you might say, well, is it maximum or minimum? Because we haven't been given a current direction for what we're calling positive or even a direction of the magnetic field lines, you can't possibly say what's maximum, what's minimum. Um, you just, uh, you can just say maximum or minimum, define a direction as you like. Okay, so that's, uh, that's question 7D. Okay. Um, all right, Aisha and Shane are now discussing how to convert the assembly shown in figure seven so that it operates as a motor. Okay, so it's currently a generator. We want to turn it into a motor. They both agree that a DC battery should connect to the output terminals and a split ring commutator should replace the rings. Good. They choose to keep the transformer between the DC battery and the split ring commutator. Explain whether the new assembly will or will not operate as a motor. Support your answer. So, um, it won't. Um, the reason is if we put a battery here and then send that um, energy or that current in, then uh, we'd have to induce a current over on this, well, what would now be the secondary side, right? We'd have to induce a current over here and send that into the loop. But a DC current on the primary side is not going to induce a current uh, in the transformer, okay? So we're going to say um, the motor will not work. Um, a DC uh, input into the transformer will not create a changing magnetic field. Um, therefore, no changing flux in the secondary. Therefore, no um, induced current in the secondary coil. Okay, so, um, oh, sorry, that's all off screen. Um, let me quickly read that to you again. Uh, the motor won't work. So that's, you gotta, you gotta say that for one mark really explicitly. Um, and the reason, the DC input into the transformer will not create a changing magnetic field. That means that we know change in flux in the secondary, which means that we know induced current in the secondary coil, which means no current in the motor. And whenever I write a longer answer, I just want to read the question again to make sure I've sort of hit the actual points that I want me to hit. Support your answer of with a relevant explanation of the relevant principles of physics. Yeah, I think you really just have to say no change in flux means no induction. Um, and explain whether or not it won't work. It will work. It won't. Okay. Uh, question eight is a projectile motion question. Um, golf ball is projected from the top of a platform um, with an unknown height um, at a speed of 30 meters per second and an angle of 25 degrees. Um, as shown here, the ball position is initially eight meters above ground level. Okay. The golf ball travels a horizontal distance of 87 meters as it first strikes the ground. Okay. Show that the flight time of the golf ball from its initial starting point to when it first strikes the ground is 3.2 seconds. Show our working. Okay. Um, so the fact that it's talking about how long something takes, um, means that this is one that we're going to do with SUVATs, not with energy. Um, 
because uh, so energy can tell you how fast something's going through the kinetic energy or how high it is through the gravitational potential, but it can't tell you how it got there and how long it took. Okay, so um, we're going to use SUVATs here. And so as usual, we'll, we'll break our SUVATs into horizontal and vertical components. Um, so that two, like this, and uh, let me make a little table so that we can see that clearly. Okay, so this is the thing we're after. And we'll look for what information we've been given. So first off, the horizontal distance it goes, um, it tells you that it goes 87 metres horizontally. Um, and we don't know how far it goes vertically, but we do know it's negative H. Um, so whatever that height there is, it, it's, it's uh, negative that. Um, the initial speed in the initial velocity in the horizontal and vertical directions. We don't know directly, but we are told the magnitude and the angle. So we can use cos and sine to grab those. Um, so I'll just do that. Um, so we get 27.189 meters per second horizontally and 12.67 or 12.68 meters per second vertically. Um, now notice that I've, I've kept more decimal places than I plan to actually use in the end. And, and it's important that you do that when you, when you um, multiplying things through. I'm probably going to ignore my own advice later in the um, video, but hopefully for now that's right. Um, we don't know the final velocities and we don't care at this, this stage. We might care later, but we don't at the moment. Um, in the horizontal direction, we have no acceleration and in the vertical, we have negative 9.8. That's the very definition of, um, of projectile motion. Okay, so with that in mind, we can find time. Um, the easiest one to use here is, um, well, we don't have enough information on this vertical side. So you need three pieces of information and we don't have, them. so we better use the horizontal here. Um, so we're going to use S equals UT plus a half AT squared. But of course that's going to be really easy because that half AT squared is zero here. So we've just got constant speed times time. Um, so we're going to find time equals uh, 87 meters over 27.189 meters per second is going to be equal to, and I won't even get out the calculator because I'm just going to say it's equal to 3.2. So that's a little exam trick. Um, okay, so B asks us to um, find H, so find how far this thing here is. And the idea here is, well, we know now how long it takes to go up. So we're going to, we're going to imagine shooting it upwards and then saying, well, how long is it going to take to come all the way back down again. Um, if it takes 3.262 seconds, how far is it going to have gone down by? Um, so we know the initial velocity, but now we know that this here is 3.2 seconds. So we're going to be able to find this. Okay, so we're just going to plug all those things in once again. Um, we got one, two, three known pieces of information, one unknown. So we're just actually going to use that same equation again. Uh, SV equals UVT plus a half AVT squared. So that's negative H equals uh, 12.679 meters per second times 3.2 seconds minus 4.9 meters per second to minus two times 3.2 seconds squared. Now, I don't know whether they want us to use the full 3.2 Da, 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 um, version that we would have got out of this. Um, but I assume that they have to accept both if they're telling you to prove that it's 3.2 seconds in the one above. So I'm just going to leave it as the rounded 3.2. Um, hopefully that doesn't cause too many problems. Time 3.2. And we get... Um, negative H on the left hand side equals negative 9.605 meters on the right hand side. So H, H equals 9.6 meters. Um, and I believe we're done. Yeah, that's question eight. Okay. Oh, that's it for that question. Nine. All right, a car of mass of 1,000 kilograms, there's going to be a collision problem. 
travels to the right at 20 meters per second, has a head-on collision with a truck, uh, 3,000 kilograms, traveling at five. Uh, after the collision, the car rebounds to left at 10. Uh, turn the magnitude of the velocity of the truck immediately after the collision. So this is just a um, uh, momentum before equals momentum after. So P initial equals P final. So this is conservation of momentum. Um, so P initial is uh, M1U1 plus M2U2. P final is M1V1 plus M2V2. And uh, all we're doing here is just plugging in numbers and solving for uh, V2 because we want the truck. So let's quickly do that. A thousand kilograms times uh, 20 meters per second. plus 3,000 kilograms times, uh, now it's traveling to the left at five meters per second, so that means negative five meters per second. Momentum has direction on it. Okay, so that comes out to uh, 1,000, so that's 20,000 minus 15,000. So we have positive 5,000 kilogram meters per second. So that's our P initial. And our P final is, well, uh, afterwards the car is rebounding to the left at 10 meters per second. So that means we have negative 10,000 kilogram meters per second for the car, plus some unknown for the truck. So conservation of momentum sells as P truck final is gonna be equal to, well, it better be positive 15,000 kilogram meters per second because it needs to be positive 5,000 total and the car is contributing negative 10,000. So that means the truck needs to have positive 15,000. Now the truck weighs 3,000 kilograms. So that means V truck final is gonna be uh, five meters per second to the right. Okay, so the truck is basically just bounced straight off, whereas the car is completely turned around by a ratio of from 20 forward to 10 backwards. Okay, determine using calculations whether the collision is inelastic or, elastic or inelastic. Uh, well, it's almost certainly inelastic, but let's actually do the collision. All we have to do is um, kinetic energy before, kinetic energy initial equals a half mass of the car times u of the car squared plus a half the mass of the truck times u of the truck squared. Um, let's, that's just a calculator problem. Let's just stick that in the calculator. Collision problems are very boring. Um, what's the mass of the car again? Uh, so a thousand times 20 squared. So, so this guy has 200 thousand joules and uh, 3,000 times five squared. Uh, this guy only has uh, 37,500 joules. So notice that the truck, because most of its momentum is in mass form, not in velocity form, when we work out the energies, the car has a lot more energy here. So the total energy here is 237,500 joules. And the kinetic energy after, we just do the same thing again, but with our new numbers. So now the car is going, the car still has a mass of 1,000, but now it's going at negative uh, 10. So negative 10 squared is 100, 100 times 1,000. So we get 100,000 times a half. 50,000 joules for the car, half MV squared with its new V. And the truck is going at five, kilom five meters per second now, uh, according to our answer above, and it weighs 3,000. So that's gonna be five times five times 3,000. Um, that hasn't changed. It was going at five meters per second in, it goes five meters per second out. So it's kinetic energy is unchanged, 37,500. 
So the total kinetic energy is only 87,500 joules. Um, kinetic energy final does not equal kinetic energy initial, therefore not elastic. Okay, so whenever you're asked about elasticity, it's just calculate your kinetic energy before, kinetic energy after. If they're not the same, it's not elastic. Um, it's very rarely elastic. So if you had to guess here, just guess inelastic. Okay, question 10. How close are we to finishing this? We'll climb from about two thirds of the way through. Um, yeah. Slingshot uses a rubber band and fires a pellet of mass 25.5 grams to a vertical height of 18 meters. The rubber band was stretched by 10 centimeters prior to the vertical release of the pellet. Okay. The release of the pellet and its rise through the air is seem to be totally efficient. So what they mean there is you're not losing energy to, um, to friction and stuff inside the, the actual mechanism. Um, uh, the extension of the rubber band does not disrupt any of the material bonds of the rubber. Okay, so once again, that's just saying no energy has been lost to, to the rubber band itself or anything like that. On the axis below, sketch the force versus extension graph for the rubber. Uh, so we want, we want to do a Hooke's Law graph for this rubber band. And at first, you might say, well, how can we possibly do that? But what we're going to do is we're going to work out the K value using this information here, we're going to work out the K value of the rubber band, and then we're going to use that to sketch this. Okay. So first work out K value. Okay. So the fact that this mass went to a height of 18 meters tells us how much energy the graph, uh, how much energy was stored in the rubber band. So energy stored in rubber band um, in band initially equals um, gravitational energy of pellet at max height. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. So whatever energy was stored in the band when we pulled it down 10 centimeters, um, that all of that energy got converted into um, gravitational energy of that pellet mass. So what we can say is U S initial equals U gravity final. So this is a half K Delta X initial squared equals M G H final. Now we know how much the pellet weighs. We know the strength of gravity. We know how high it went at its max. Maybe instead of final, I'll put max there because it does fall down again afterwards. Um, we know how far the rubber band was stretched. That was 10 centimeters. We know half is half, so we can find K. So K here is going to be equal to two M G H max over delta x initial squared. And we can just plug in those numbers. Um, once again, good idea to write down in brackets you're plugging in because you can get marks for it even if you make a stuff up on the calculator. So let's do that. So in this case, that's two times 25.5 times 10 to the negative three kilograms. H is 18 meters, it's pretty high. Um, and delta X is 0 0.10 meters squared. So K, it's gonna be a pretty big number, I think. Oh no, it's got that 10 to the negative three in it. Okay, not that big. Negative three. Oh, okay. Sorry, I just did exactly that thing of stuffing up, stuffing these into my calculator. Okay, so we get 91.8 newtons per kilogram there. 
And then from there, we can just, um, we can pretty much go ahead and, oh, sorry, not newtons per kilogram, newtons per meter. Uh, oh my goodness, I didn't put G in here. Oh, oh my goodness, 9.8 newtons per kilogram for minus one. So K equals, it's all that times 9.8. 899.64 kilograms per meter. Not kilograms, but newtons per meter. Hold on. Kilograms. Kilogram, kilogram. Newtons, meters, meters. Yeah, okay. Newtons per meter. Whew. Um, which is a K value. Okay, so we have 899.64 newtons per meter. So what that means is on this graph here, the easiest thing we could do is just make this last line here. Um, let me redraw my graph. Just make this last dot here 100 centimeters, i.e. one meter. So how much, uh, how much force would be required to get it to go one meter? Well, 899.64. So let's make this number here 900 newtons. Um, so force in newtons, extension in centimeters. And so we just go bang there and we, we can even label that 100, 899.6 and do a nice straight line in between them. Um, and we're done. Uh, that box is in the way, but, hold on. um, so if we put 100 centimetres there, then we know that um, F equals KX lines are straight. So you don't really have to label anything in between. You can stick a few points along the way if you want. Um, label a few extra bits and pieces along here. Label a few extra bits and pieces along here and you're done. Um, <coughs> yeah, um, you, could, you could choose to plug in a few extra X values and get a few extra points if you wanted to, but the principle is the same. The, the, the hard part here, or the thing that you really have to see, which is why it's worth five marks, is that the gravitational energy at the top is equal to how much energy was stored in that spring before we um, fired it off. Okay, question 11. All right, so we've got a loop-to-loop -loop question. Um, car of mass 800 kilogram, go through a loop-to-loop -loop carnival, okay. Question 11A, uh, on figure 12, draw and label the forces acting on the car. The size of the force vectors must indicate if they're equal or different sizes. Okay, so if this car is at the bottom of a loop and it has entered the circular motion phase, which it has because its front wheel is on that circular motion, that circular part, then uh, that means the net force, so let me draw that as a dotted line because it doesn't actually want, it doesn't actually ask you for the net force. So let me be really careful about not drawing that as a fully fledged force here. Um, draw and label the forces acting on the car. So we have, um, we have F of gravity acting on the car there, FG on C. And then we have a normal force acting upwards which is, um, it's got to be bigger than the gravity force because we need a net force, which is upwards. We need a net force, which is towards the center of the circle because we're in centripetal motion here. So let's call this F, um, maybe N, C, F of the normal force on the car. Um, it doesn't say what sort of label conventions we need to use here. So, so that would probably be enough. But if you want to be really careful, you could say over to the right here, FGC equals gravity on car. And FNC equals um, road um, acting on car. Um, at the bottom of the loop, the car travels at 12 meters per second. The diamond loops 10 meters track uh, frictionless. Determine the size of the normal reaction of the car when it's at the bottom of the loop. Okay, so we're actually going to find this. So all this information here about the circular motion itself, the diet, the speed, and the radius, 
those are going to help us find the net force. So um, B F C equals the net force equals MV squared over R. So that's always true for circular motion. And we know M, we know V and we know R here. So um, F net is going to be equal to 800 kilograms times uh, 12 meters per second squared. All squared divided by 10 meters. So that's 80 times 144 uh, newtons. which is 11,520 newtons. But that's, that's the net force. We're not asked for the normal force. We, so we're not asked for the net force, we're asked for the normal force. So the normal force is gonna be equal to 11,520 newtons plus the gravitational force, which is downwards. Because together, when we, when we take that gravitational force and we put the normal force on it, we get the net force as the result. So let me, let me quickly draw a, a quick diagram to show that. Um, here's gravity, Fg. Here's our normal force, F normal. And here's our net force, which has to be equal to 11,520 newtons. So, the, so at the bottom of the loop, the normal force has to be really big in order to get this circular motion going. It needs to overcome gravity and then create the centripetal force. Um, so it needs to be really big and that's why you feel really heavy when you're at the bottom of the loop. Um, so 11,520 plus, so, it's, so there's 11,520. We also need this bit here and that bit there is gonna be 9.8 newtons per kilogram times 800 kilograms, which is, 9.8 times 800 is 7,840 newtons. So our normal force is going to have to be 19,360 newtons. Okay, and that's our normal force. Okay, we're up to question 12. Um, I might take another short break. Um, because once again, my throat is being ripped to pieces.